Welcome to week seven of services marketing. We're looking at the physical evidence side of services marketing. This is one of the elements of the extended services marketing mix. And whilst the service scape features heavily, it's not the sum total of the physical evidence. So the plan for the session and the plan for the video is to talk through the role of physical evidence uh, aspects of the service location, service provision, but the real emphasis in this chapter is going to be the service scape model. And along the way, what uh, I'm interested in getting people to think about is how the co-creation activities that we've covered in the first half of the semester would link in to the consumption and the interpretation of a service scape. So, into the content, and let's kick off with the physical evidence. Now, one of the things in services marketing that we've gone and mentioned quite a few times is that there is a balance between the each aspect of the IHIP model, so the intangibility, the heterogeneity, the inseparability, the perishability, where you either embrace it or you mitigate it. The role of physical evidence is in part to mitigate the intangibility. So where you are working in an environment where your service is very high in the credence attributes, people are unsure even after experiencing the service, whether they had a good service encounter, had a good service experience, we can use physical evidence as a social signifier, as a prompt and cue. So people can look around and go, yes, this was a good investment of my time, effort and money. In particular, we always pick on the legal office and the lawyer's office, but for good reason. When you stack a, an environment full of leather bound texts and there's leather bound chairs and there's a leather bound desk with a leather bound pen on it you look around the place going wow these guys are probably quite prestigious and quite conservative and quite expensive so i must be getting a good uh, service delivery here similarly you walk into a doctor's environment and it's brightly lit and everything's white and gleaming and has that whole sense of well, it feels like it's sanitized. All of the physical evidence elements of a service simply connect to the idea of packaging. Packaging up the intangible experience in a way that the customer can see, can engage with, with their senses, and use as a proxy for decision making. So there are some other additional complicated elements inside uh, the use of the physical evidence and the service environment around things like queuing, around the service delivery process. But there's also a, an aspect to consider in the service environment about the way in which a, how you design a service facilitates the interaction between customers and facilitates the interaction between customers and employees. In particular, if we think about something like a lecture theater environment where it's the two to three stories high worth of seats and one person at the visual focal point of the room who has the lectern, then there's a power dynamic. The physical environment is creating power dynamic. Compare that to uh, one of the flat track venues like your Cambry where you're at tables, you're interacting with each other, and even in that where it's the facilitator or lecturer is standing up and everyone else is sitting down. There are cueings into there are social messages and social cues that you can use through physical environments and physical messages. The last thing on this is that the physical evidence is way easier to defend legally. And this is gonna sound like a strange thing in a services context. But because you can't trademark or can't easily trademark or patent a service, the intangible skills-based aspect of the service, 
it's quite often a lot easier to create a physical environment around that service that you can protect with patents, trademarks, because you're using physical objects, you're using physical manifestation of goods so that protect those legally and deny your competitors the opportunity to use something similar. Also in the differentiation, the visual cueing that you get from a physical environment differentiates the firm. There's that moment when you walk into a venue and you use the whole of your sensory array plus your experience with like-minded products and similar products to judge whether you're in the right venue or not. So on the packaging side, uh, we have quality, we have physical evidence used as a quality assumption, um, and a terrible pun is in there. We have it leading towards the brand image. We can also then use the physical evidence to create ancillary secondary physical goods. We can use it to create merchandise. So you watch, you go to a service, uh, an entertainment service like the uh, NRL and the final series, uh, you watch the Canberra Raiders play, it's a service. But with the physical evidence of the uniforms, the team merchandise, the team logos, all the material that physically is present builds up into a brand image, a brand image that you can buy, take home and embody. So we're also looking at this as the idea that if you think about the physical goods playing the role of the, the wrapper on the service, the service experience remains the intangible, but we put a structure, a wrapper of tangibility around it to, to reduce perceived risk and lower cognitive dissonance. So the more objects that are present and particularly Objects that are used to signify parts of the service that you take home after the purchase. You go to even something as basic as you, and it's one of my favorite things, you go to a fortune teller. They read your fortune in the cards and they hand you, you either walk away with nothing, but if they also hand you a small rundown of what it was that you just, you know, a small set of notes. These were the cards that came up that were of significance tangibilizing the experience. So there are ways and means. The second role of the service scape is literally in the facilitation of the service process. Physical evidence sits inside the distribution, so place and distribution overlap into physical evidence quite strongly here, in that the service environment can help provide information such as how and where do I act? The, it can establish the sequence from ordering to consumption to co-creation. And we can use physical layouts to locate the consumer where, we, where they're most efficiently uh, well, engaged. But also you can separate the technical core. Things like you can see into the kitchen, but you're not allowed to go into the kitchen at a restaurant. You can see the backstage area of the technical core being produced so you know it's happening but you're being safely kept away from any possible risk harm or accident in the process so there are means by which this again the role of the physicality is to create a mechanism to let the customer understand what they're supposed to do in the service environment Third up is the socialization aspect. Uh, things like, you know, we bring up uniforms here very quickly because you're also setting up an environment where the customers are temporary participants in the service scape. The employee is a permanent fixture of the service scape. So you need to establish, you know very quickly as a service employee, you will get into routines, you'll get into means and methods by which you know how to deliver your service or to engage in your service activity. But unless your customer has been socialized into understanding what their role is and what they need to be doing, 
it's going to be much harder for them. So using the service cape to establish who works here, and believe me, there have been times where dressing as I do, I have been asked questions about shops that I've gone into, and it's like, I don't actually work here. I just dress like the staff. What you also want to do with something like a uniform is that uniforms are cognitive shortcuts. Psychological shortcuts, they are basically exploiting the inherent weakness of most humanity to, to move to rush judgment as quickly as possible. So if there is a consistent identifying symbol, then you can see this is who is on the production side of the service, and this is who is on the consumption side of the service. You're easily able to identify from the subduction model who is other customer and who is the employee. The final thing that we want to raise again is the idea of using the service scape as the means of differentiation. And I'm still talking a little bit about the personnel here. That's going to come up in um, the next chapter when we talk about service personnel. But the facilities of a service are a means by which you can communicate expectations and positioning strategies. You can establish very quickly where what people should expect from your service in terms of its uh, you can start thinking things like drawn advertising promotion, positioning maps, positioning strategies. The referent pricing idea from consumer behavior also has reference service quality. What does something that looks similar to this service that you've just walked into, what would you expect someone that had a similar sort of service game? So you walk into a gym, it's full of equipment, you're expecting it to be an exercise based environment. If you were to walk into a restaurant where everything was set up with gym equipment, questions would be asked and not all of them would be resolved. To start with, it's bad enough when they're serving you your food deconstructed on a chopping board, it's worse when it's being handed to you on a five kilo dumbbell. But your differentiation factor, your things like your theme parks, your environment, uh, your environmental aspects, your tourism elements, there are a whole lot of ways in which you can use your service scape and your physical evidence to s create a point in the consumer's mind and their mental map of value alternatives as to where you should be. So let's start talking about physical cues and physical cueing and uh, playing into the service scape. The first thing that's going to happen, the fundamental theory that underpins services, the service scape is the idea of the Rossiter and Donovan, or Donovan and Rossiter, and this is a model from back in 82, uh, the stimulus organism response model. Now a quick bit of Australian context here is that John Rossiter is the leading, was, is and was the leading uh, researcher in advertising and communications, uh, IMC work. Rob Donovan was ranked one of the world's best social marketers and social change advocates. So these are two of Australia's top researchers created this highly influential, globally influential model. I think Rossiter's retired and Donovan was at least thinking about hanging up the boots, uh, but he was based over in West Australia. Rossiter's somewhere down in uh, Wollongong. So the similar, stimulus organism response model is this idea that there are three elements to your reaction. There's the stimuli, there's the service scape. The service scape, the physical environment that you encounter will result in you responding in, one of, in the emotional states. Now they focused on the pad state, pleasure, arousal, and dominance. The result of encountering this reaction, your own personal physical reaction to the environment, will be either to approach and to continue engaging with the environmental stimuli or to avoid it. So 
the ultimate objective here in the um, SOR model is to try to predict what is most likely to cause an approach for the market you want and an avoidance for the market you do not want using your service. So, the key in this, the responses, the consumer response is somewhere on the spectrum of pleased to displeased, agitated to calm, and feeling in control to feeling out of control. We measure it with these particular models. Like this, uh, the scale that's on the screen here, the pad scale, is a highly regarded, highly cited and frequently used market research tool. You circle the figure that best represents how you feel and it's very much a, an immediate reactive response. So we bring you into ServiceScape environment, we get you to experience something within that environment and then we get you to fill out the pad scale. The new addition is the like and thank you Facebook for bringing us the thumbs um, as a market research tool. So, having established the underpinning framework of the stimulus organism response, what its value, its true value is, is when we go and combine it with a means by which we can do strategic decision making for marketing and services marketing. In that, what we're looking at is the service scapes being used in the design of an overall value offer. Now, remembering that in the seduction model, ServiceScape is one of four interconnecting elements that links into the value proposition. The ServiceScape will also facilitate the role of other customers. It will facilitate how the employees engage in their role and the invisible processes through things like the Service Blueprint tool will enable or be required in order to enable a service scape. So there's a couple of technical aspects in here. There's the idea of the self-service service scape. Uh, a lot of technology is based on this. A lot of the, so this is effectively, this is like the Wattle site is a self-service service scape. ATM, vending machines, a lot of physical evidence based encounters that don't use another person, but still have an automated or machine delivered service environment. In the middle is what we would classically recognize as a services marketing transaction, and it's the use of interpersonal, where the co-production and co-consumption of the service is at its highest because the person creating the service and the person consuming the service are at the, in the same service scape, working in conjunction, working together to get the best outcome. On the far end is the idea of the remote service where only the employee is present inside the service scape. In essence, this is what happens when I sit in my office and I record these videos, I am in the remote services. When I do this in, and you hear this over the Echo 360 or you're in the classroom in Cambry, we are at the interpersonal services where you are consuming this and you're using the Waddle site and you're watching these videos, you're at self-service. So the whole services marketing has all three elements of ServiceScape in action, underway, throughout the entire subject. And it's how you consume the subject that determines where you're going to be in this spectrum. So on the side here, by the way, that is, if you haven't seen it before, welcome to the semester. This is Cambry 202. Uh, in terms of service scapes that seem to be able to be replicated the world around, this is a teaching classroom from the University of Leicestershire. Uh, if they're quite similar in design. In fact, the Leicestershire has the thing, Cambry was supposed to have the folding walls there you can see that they set the tracks for it. Here in Leicestershire they actually implemented it. So again a double room like this was supposed to fold down in the middle. 
but you can see the physical environments are sort of getting uniform and unified. Now your big theoretical framework, the Mary Jo Bittner 1992 Serverscape paper. This is the go-to. This is uh, when we're talking about the understanding of how services are delivered inside either interpersonal or remote services. This is your go-to. Self-service, there's a lot of adaptations of it. But fundamentally, the whilst we're going to go through some of the key uh, sub-elements, there are two things to understand about this model from the outset. First, it is a measure of employee and customer responses. Your service scape is designed and needs to be designed with your employees in mind because they will be occupying the service scape for longer than your customers ever will. The second aspect of this, because it's a coexistence, you are also, in this model here, we are doing this as perceived service scape, one cohort of customers and their response are. Same cohort, their response. But what you also will have is that you will have multiple cohorts of customers inside the same service scape at the same time. So the simultaneous co-production aspect plus the idea of the subduction model of the customers, they play a role in the service scape, and this is the overlap. We're gonna focus down on how customers react to the specific value offer that you're putting in front of them, of the service, the physical service environment, how they engage with it, how they respond to it. You need to be mindful of how your employees, but we'll also pick that up again when we go into the chapter on people and look at that element of the marketing mix. So this is this idea of this holistic crossover that there are many points in which we will come back to a similar concept to see how it's applied in a different manner. Now we go back to the model, uh, the physical environment. Now this is the ambient conditions. These are the physical, these are sometimes not as controllable for a services marketer. Sometimes they're absolutely under our control. And it's things like the lighting, the level, brightness, darkness, the use of uh, lighting to convey messages, air quality. I always joke about Lush and the fact that I need a respirator mask to go in there. But is it really a hairdressing salon if you don't come out feeling like the air was flavoured? Is it really... The air quality issues can also link into things like the... Uh, the aromatics, a coffee shop with a very strong airborne flavor, uh, the bakery that has the very strong smell of fresh uh, bread, all these aspects that you are able to control and adjust to create a physical, and basically you're thinking here now a little bit more like a good space marketer of what cues, elements, and triggers can I install into the environment to get a response from a customer, a target customer who enters this particular and this specific set of conditions? The second part of the physical components is space and function. What does it look like? What is the layout of the facility? What's the equipment? Uh, is it front stage or backstage? The, what are the subtle messages that you're using? Hard edges and hard shapes, soft edges, light plain versus shaded. There's a lot of stuff in this. Uh, you can get yourself absolutely a career as an interior designer of services marketing products and get into it if uh, it's a value to you. The third thing, the signs, symbols, artifacts, style of decor, decor. Uh, I've got here Heathrow Terminal 3. 
Well, this has always amused me. Whenever I've popped up at Terminal 3 to catch my Qantas flight to go home from the UK, the huge letter sign. There is no question about which terminal that you should be pointed at. But the tiny little sign saying arrivals that way. This is the departures. The relative scale of like, yes, you know precisely where you are, that's and where you need to be. So the signage here is very, it's very instrumental. Uh, since I'm a Qantas flyer, I know Terminal 3, boarding area B. I can almost navigate it in my sleep, but I can certainly navigate it in my, I'm going to, uh, I know at this point, I should be headed off to the side this way, but you're always tucking through C because it's just in front of the lifts and swing around the corner. But you also see that the information board there provides travellers who are unfamiliar with the venue immediate brand level brand recognition. You know the logo of the airline you're travelling, even if you're working on a language that's different to the one uh, the, you're not operating on um, English, British or um, UK standards, you can recognise the logo and recognise the symbol and it can direct you. So, all these objects, all these physical elements basically create the idea or create this framework in our heads. And we create this idea of the perceived service scape that remembering our key idea, perception governs reality. What we perceive is what is real. So this idea here now, the perceived service scape, what are all of these objects, these physical artifacts, these physical elements and conditions come together to create as a perceptual landscape we are operating in to consume our service. So this gets, again, subjective. Now within that, uh, one of the things we're going to see recur throughout this is that a service scape is heavily dependent on a market segment. Now the chapter just raises four typologies, four possible segments, and their interaction with the service scape. The price sensitive economic customer who doesn't really care about the environment that they're in so long as the price is right. The personalized customer who wants this service environment to be about them. They want an experience. They want more from the physical landscape than just, they're not really worried about the price, although that will always be a factor. They want something. Now, I may have also mentioned periodically how much, how important it is to always be careful about the way you describe your market segments. The idea of calling convenience customers apathetic customers, that's a dumb thing to do. It's a poor decision by the segment designer. Those are convenience customers. Their landscape needs to facilitate speed of transaction. And the ethical customer, the ethical customer who is looking for a smaller service scape, the personal touch, the uh, getting you know they don't want to go to the big box stores they don't want to go to the big chain stores they want a smaller service scape that can be and this is not discrete typology either you can have crossovers overlaps between these different typologies but the idea is that each of the typologies each market segment will have a certain response to your service scape and dry your ideal scenario is to create a sufficiently nuanced set of segments so that you know how the customers will respond and how they will cluster together. So, having got them through the first things, the physical, the, the, the actual and the real, through to the perceived, now we're looking at where consumer behavior kicks back in and we look at how the internal response moderators of people's reactions to their perception and the physical conditions. 
Key to this for you is to remember that services marketing does not exist in a vacuum uh, and that the other theories of consumer behavior take effect here and apply every bit as much as our core service gate model. This leads us up to consumer behavior response. You also want to be mindful of the fact that the same responses that are going to take place in your customer will take place in your employee. So you want those to be positive for both parties. In this, there are three types of cognitive response. Cognitive is the predominantly rationale, uh, predominantly uh, calculative. So it's the idea of the belief. In response to a service scape, you will form a belief about the product, about the brand, about the service. We will regard that product-based belief as being the formation of knowledge. So you walk into a service encounter and there are, it effectively instructs you on how to perform the service. That will be belief, the gaining of knowledge. Your cognition will also be used as you start to calculate the positioning the internal positioning strategy of the service scape and the service experience against the categorization frameworks that you already have in your head. What is similar, what is like? You walk into the temple of jobs, the Apple store, glass fronting, wood paneling, slightly muted LED lighting. That gives you an immediate, as soon as you walk into another store like that, you are positioning, okay, it's and I, it's an Apple Store knockoff, or you are starting to position these service experiences around to make sense of them. Categorization is the sense making, and it fits in with things like positioning strategy as a theory and practice. Finally, in the cognition element is the symbolic meaning, the interpretation of the various aspects at a cognitive level. It's what does it mean? Is this going to be expensive, cheap? How do I classify it? How do I categorize it? How do I come to a sort of summary conclusion and make sense of it? Now, the companion to all cognition is emotive response. And emotive response starts with the, I like it, I dislike it. And we've got a whole bunch of different moods and attitudes and there's the Geneva emotion wheel to give us a nuanced selection of uh, emotions to work with. But fundamentally it comes down to do you have a positive inclination or a negative inclination towards the physical experience of the service environment that you're currently going through. Lastly is your body's actual reaction to the conditions of the service scape. Now I talk about the tough mud on a regular basis but the idea of pain as a response normally is a negative, sometimes it's a positive. But if you find when you are engaging in a, you, you walk into a service environment and suddenly things hurt. The lights are too bright, the music's too loud, the air is too um, solid. Yeah, it's pretty much me walking to a lush around Christmas time. I've learned not to. But you have a, if you have a physiological, biological, biofeedback response to a service scape, that is beyond your initial cognitive or emotive control, and it will create cognitive responses and it'll create emotional responses. All of which, again, marketers, consumer behavior is a lead up to a point. The point and our objective being, we want to have a response. We want a behavioral response. And services marketing, we have two categories, approach or avoidance. We want to use ServiceScape to create intentional and deliberate avoidance behaviors. We want to establish, use our ServiceScape to signify, to signal if you are the right customer or the wrong customer so it loops back into the seduction model around the other customers process. People who are going to have a similar like-minded positive response to a service scape 
are most likely to be customers who will like to be in proximity with each other. So you're using your service environments as a filter mechanism. If it's creating the avoidance behaviors to the audiences that you don't want, then it's also playing a defensive role in keeping the wrong markets away from your customer base or the sort of market that would detract from the service ex experience of your primary target markets. On the, on the proactive side, the approach behaviors. What you're wanting at the end of the day, we're commercial services marketers, there is one thing we want, and that is quite simply, we want money spent. At the end of the, the run, we can talk about anything else we like whatsoever, but if they're not spending money in the service gate, it's gone wrong for us. So we've got to be very, very aware of that. Everything else is secondary, that's primary. A favorable impression of the store, so it leads to money spent. Time spent shopping, so it leads to more money being spent. Willingness to stay and explore the store, so you buy more things, so you spend more time shopping, so you have a favorable impression, money spent. Repeat visits, spending money again and again. Enjoying the shopping, wanting to come back and spend more money. If people are not enjoying your service scape, but they're still spending money there, you're fine. If they're doing anything else, and but they're not spending the money, it's gone wrong. Now the last uh, thing I want to talk about here, because I'm going to flick past all the stuff around the sensory elements to the instruction manual that is the textbook. Managing the service scape, managing the physical environment, managing the physical evidence. It all comes down to a very familiar question set. Who is the firm's target market? This is why I've been on at you all semester so far to get good at segmentation. A service scape boils down to who's the audience and what do they want? What is the value offer that target market wants to experience from your service? Do they want convenience? Do they want straight in, straight out, minimum time spent shopping, maximum positive response? Do they want to linger? Do they want to have an ongoing engagement in the service? So in fact, going shopping is the end in itself. And the longer you can spend, the better it is. You gotta know that about your target market because once you create that and you start thinking about, well, what are the atmospheric elements? What's the physical trace elements? What are the physical objects that can reinforce the responses you want from your target market? You also wanna check in on how that works with employee satisfaction. We pick that up again in the employee chapter next, uh, next cycle. And also, because they're a target market, they're not just yours exclusively. They are people who engage in a wide range of shopping behaviors and have alternatives that they can choose from. So what you're, again, looking for is how can you establish a physical, physical evidence that proactively encourages your customer base to engage with you, to buy from you, and also positions you effectively against rival customers. So your service scape comes back to that positioning strategy and it all is underpinned by the one single starting question, who is the target market and what do they want from the service scape encounter? So to recap, the service scape can be the, the functional things that you require for the service to take place. It can be the creation of an expectation. People look at the service and decide what it is that should be taking place based on the perceived service scape. It can be the mechanism by which we get people to assume they've received value. But also, the thing to understand about tangibility in services marketing is it's more than just the service scape. Service scape is one useful theory, it's a theory, it's not the theory. There are other ways to engage.